Hello, my name is Linda Boyd, and I am helping to organize with East King County Public Utility District, and I'm your host tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Some of you will remember when Puget Sound Energy was sold, and I'm still hot from it. After all this time, um, I remember attending the public hearings, and particularly the one on the east side, there were, the, there were voices of outrage, and only one person who was a stockholder mentioned that he thought it would be good to be able to sell his stock at $30 a share. And one of the commissioners held out for a while, and finally all three commissioners agreed to sell to Macquarie, which was an a Australian corporation, and to uh, Canadian firms. Macquarie promised, all of them promised, that we would have cleaner energy, better service, improved infrastructure, and that they would be in it for the long term. Now, some of you don't know that Macquarie has already sold. So they sold to a, a Dutch firm and Canadian firm. So most of those promises have not borne out. So I am so delighted to, uh, to have found that there are people organizing for this project. So we're going to take so, some more time for dinner. And then we're going to hear from um, a couple of people. And then we're going to hear from Dennis Kucinich. And I'm going to tell you, he has a little laryngitis. Of course. So we're going to continue with the show. And uh, I think it'll all work out. So please enjoy the food. And thank you for coming. Sarah Papa Nicolau is a founding member of 350 East Side and is a graduate student at Johns Hopkins University in the Energy and Climate Policy Program. She lives in Woodinville, and she uh, enjoys climbing in the mountains, hiking, skiing with her husband and two children, and she's going to talk for about five minutes about her work. Thank you for welcoming Sarah. Thank you, Linda. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about 350 East Side and, and what has uh, brought me and our group to this really important work of bringing a PUD to East King County. So as uh, Linda mentioned, um, I am currently a grad student. I am studying energy and climate policy, and my focus is on utilizing renewables for climate adaptation. So if we put offshore wind um, in an area where hurricanes come in, it can actually slow down the speed of the winds that are going to hit the affected communities when the hurricane makes landfall. So thinking about these big picture issues is what I do a lot of. Um, before that, for 10 years, I ran a local boutique winery that I founded. And one day, I woke up to the urgency of the climate crisis. I saw firsthand um, coral bleaching and dying glaciers. And I saw what a mess we're in. Um, I felt a deep sense that there was something bigger for me to work on than making wine. And so with a group of incredible people, and I'd like to invite our other steering committee members from 350 East Side to maybe raise a hand if you wouldn't mind. Some of them are with us. Yes, thank you. So we, we co-founded the nonprofit 350 East Side. We are a, a independent local chapter of 350.org, global organization, and we work to bring climate advocacy to our region and connect people with real meaningful action that they can take to transition away from a carbon-based economy. Unfortunately, we have a huge source of greenhouse gas emissions in our own backyard, and that is PSE. Frankly, it is utterly unacceptable in 2020 for our local utility to have 56% fossil fuel-based power generation it's unacceptable for our local utility to continue to build out fracked gas infrastructure that locks us into decades of emissions and the worst effects of global warming. 
their recently built North Seattle lateral upgrade fracked gas pipeline expansion in South Snohomish County is raising our statewide greenhouse gas emissions 5% annually. Even PSE admitted it was unnecessary other than on a handful of the coldest days of the year. This expansion could have been avoided by industrial user agreements to step down natural gas consumption during high demand periods. It's very common in the industry. But PSE's profit motives reign supreme. Instead, they dammed 15 fish bearing streams that were home to threatened salmon species and polluted their waters just before spawning season so that they could build a bigger pipeline. And that pipeline runs as little as 11 feet from people's homes with a potential blast radius of 150 feet. And I've spent the past year and a half fighting this, this project. Near and dear to my heart. Um, the science says we have 10 years to drastically cut our carbon emissions if we're to avoid the most catastrophic destabilization of our climate. And we're headed that way thanks to corporate greed and government inaction. So in 2030, when that 10 years is up, my kids will be 14 and 19. And when I think about what their future will look like at that time, knowing what I know and studying what I'm studying, it is terrifying. I encourage each of you to look around at the young people in your lives and to ask yourself how old they'll be when the proverbial carbon bill comes due and act accordingly. We can do better than PSE's dirty for-profit business model, and we must for our kids and all of the kids in the developing world that lack the privilege that our kids know. I've just returned from studying climate adaptation in Nepal, and I can tell you they're already suffering. Shifting monsoon seasons and rapidly declining Himalayan snowpack are causing water shortages and power outages, crop failures and health impacts in a country where the average annual income is barely $1,000. As I research potential solutions for the challenges that they're facing, I'm struck by the gravity of our actions here in one of the more affluent parts of the developed world. When you look at the balance of carbon emissions globally, we're responsible for putting on average 10 to 20 times more climate wrecking gases into the atmosphere than the developing world. And we're on the wrong path with emissions continuing to march upward and the majority having occurred in my lifetime. This initiative is a huge chance for us to change the trajectory that we're on and fix our inadequate energy sourcing. We can't keep bringing power nearly a thousand miles from a coal-fired plant in Montana. There are better solutions. We need to rapidly expand distributed generation with solar and wind and invest in energy storage solutions like pumped hydro and the ever-expanding battery tech that's coming online. It's time to bring clean public power to our region and ditch PSC. It's not going to be easy, but we're going to do it. Thank you. Okay, the next thing on our agenda is Joe Dobner. And Joe is one of the organizers with East King County Public Utilities District, and he's going to talk about, a little bit about uh, why we're doing it and give us some information. And here we go. Joe. All right. Well... I am going to talk tonight a little bit about uh, the history of PSE, how we got to where we are right now, and what we can do about it, and of course, why we're forming a public utility district. So let's start with how we got here. So back in 1990, there was the first IPCC report that came out that said, hey, you know, the earth is warming, we're all in agreement on this, and if we don't start cutting emissions, bad things are going to happen. 1995, the second one came out. Says more of the same, but more intensely. And back in 1996, as some of you will remember, um, the local power utility was called Puget Sound Power and Light. They basically provided power and light. That's it. Uh, they had some hydroelectric plants. They had a they had a big coal plant in uh, Coal Strip, 
and a smaller share of the Centralia coal plant and some uh, some uh, dual fuel peaker turbines that they would turn on when demand got really high, like in the middle of winter. And that was pretty much it. It was basically 50-50 coal and hydro. But unfortunately, that logo is old. It's lame. It's the 90s. It's almost a new millennium. So we're going to need to do something newer and cooler. Um, so we we're going to purchase the Washington Energy Company, which was the local gas business. They owned the uh, residential gas distribution line, and they became Puget Sound Energy, which is no longer just electricity because apparently gas is energy. Technically correct, which is the worst kind of correct. Um, and starting it in 1999, they started a big buying spree. They bought their first combined cycle gas plant. Now, the combined cycle gas plants are basically gas turbines that are turbocharged. They take power off the output, put it back into the input, and they use it to generate base load. You can generate a lot of power with them. Um, and you can burn a lot of gas with them. More peakers. Another IPCC report. Shut down one of the hydro plants. More combined cycle. And we, we're going to build a wind farm now, um, which is some, somewhat novel. Oh, whoa, got another big peaker coming in. Now we got another IPCC report, a fourth one, saying, hey, guys, stop. The oceans are hotter two miles underneath the surface. We're not going to stop. <laughs> Who are we kidding? Um, and this is, this, is, this is what Linda was talking about earlier when PSE was sold to private equity. This is what their uh, CEO at the time, Steve Reynolds, had to say about it. If you don't continue to spend, you find yourself in catch-up mode the way we are with roads and bridges. And, uh, that's Chief Executive Steve Reynolds. Um, we think there's a better model than constantly going back to the capital markets year after year. And over the next two decades, he, he, he claimed at the time, Puget plans to build 10 wind farms and 10 gas-fired power plants, both to keep up with demand and to meet the company's sustainable energy requirements. Yep, two new gas plants, and a larger wind farm, and more gas plants, and a new wind farm. And that is it. So four years after they were acquired by the private equity, they basically stopped building out additional generation. Uh, they ha now have enough gas generation that they could turn off the coal-fired plants tomorrow and generate more than enough for all of their customers. They, they run their uh, gas plants very light. They're going to run their coal as long as they can. Back in the late 90s, PSE had a uh, customer's, uh, customer advisory group that told them, we don't like the fact that you're burning coal. You need to get out of the coal business. And 20 years later, maybe we're going to do it this year. <laughs> uh, so, no, we're, we're telling them they need to get off of gas. And we're looking at 2040. That's, that's too long in the future. And, well, we did another something in 2014. We're building a huge gas terminal down in Tacoma so we can sell natural gas to the shipping industry. So, again, we go from 1996 to 2020. That's, that's how we got here. Those wind, those wind plants produce 7% of the power they sell, but it's only 7%. Um, so what they've done with the wind power, though, they haven't replaced hydroelectric or they haven't replaced fossil fuels with it. They've replaced hydroelectric electricity with it. Now, to be sure, this is not a bad thing, building additional, um, building additional renewable generation, but in terms of the power mix here, it just means that they can, they can use, continue to use more fossil fuel and have, you know, a shield to hide behind. If you go to their webpage, it's a bunch of pictures of wind turbines. You'd think they were a wind energy company, but they're not. They're a gas company. Um, and since PSE stopped acquiring additional generation, the system reliability in, of the electrical grid has worsened, and they've just put in for, I think, an aggregate 9% rate, rate hike. It's a lot. So this is what their power generation has looked like over time. Now, I'm not going to go into this in too much detail, but the one on the right is, are the power plants that they own. On the bottom is the coal, which is black, and on the top, which is uh, natural gas, which is red. So as you can see, they're burning a lot more fossil fuels. And this is what's happened with their non-emitting sources. They buy a lot of hydropower from Chelan PUD and Douglas PUD, and they have stopped doing as much of that in favor of the wind, but the wind's not biting into, into fossil fuels at all. This is what's happened to their, uh, the, the grid's reliability. 
Now, if you look over, this starts in 2001 and ends in 2018. And as you can see, about the 2012 mark, things start getting worse. The five-year rolling average of outage duration and out annual outages keeps going up. And they've gotten a little bit cheaper thanks to a BPA re rebate, but with the new rate hikes, they're going to be as expensive as everyone else around here. But the thing to remember in this area is PSC is completely surrounded by public utilities, Snohomish PUD on the north, uh, Seattle City Light and Tacoma Power to the west, and those are all almost entirely clean. In fact, the energy mix for public utilities in Washington State is um, only 5% fossil. Yeah, it's, it's very clean. So, if we want to do something about it, we can't do shareholder activism because PSE, since 2008, has not been publicly traded. They don't issue shares and uh, trade them on the markets. Um, they're owned entirely by private equities. Um, they have a green direct program, but it is small. It is almost always entirely fully subscribed. So you couldn't voluntarily voluntarily buy green power. Everyone couldn't because there's just not enough of it, and they want to continue burning gas. They're a natural monopoly, and that's a technical term, and they're regulated by the State uh, Utilities and Transportation Commission. Uh, this, they can, can, to a certain extent, control PSE's behavior, but as, regula as regulators go, they're fairly weak. Um, and the other thing that being regulated at the state level does is it provides them a lack of accountability in a lot of ways. And I'm going to show you what that looks like. So this is us over here, a small group of people. The rest of the PSE customers over here and the rest of Washington State over here. We have to filter every, anything we want done through the, both the legislature and the governor because the governor nominates members of the Washington UTC and the legislature approves them. And then they can regulate PSE. Meanwhile, PSE's owners have a direct line into it. And PSE can make campaign contributions, and they make a lot of them. Um, I think last count, in the last 10 years, they've contributed to over 625 um, separate political campaigns. So we've, that's, that's going to be a hard fight. But anyway, the thing you need to know about that is... <clears throat> They're, they can't change even if they wanted to. If, if PSE decided that they wanted to, to get off of fossil fuels, they wouldn't be able to. Um, their job is to deliver profits to their owners, and so you've got a 10% bite taken out of your bill. It goes about two, or three quarters of that goes to their owners, about uh, one quarter of that goes to the people that have loaned PSE money to buy all this wonderful natural gas infrastructure. Um, they can't just abandon those investments they've made. They have to keep using it as they're effectively still paying for it. Um, and the other thing is renewable power is intermittent nature. means that you have to have a way of generating power when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining. Now, the way to do this cleanly would be storage technology. You know, as, as Sarah said earlier, pumped hydroelectric storage or battery storage or even gravitational storage. You can just haul chunks of concrete up hills on trains. There's a lot of ways to store energy. They didn't invest in that. They invested in gas. And they, they did that knowing full well what gas does. And those are bad investments and they need to be lost. We don't need to pay them for it. Um, they're... Their value proposition for their owners is they're a nice, steady stream of revenue. They, you get a nice little annual profit. You're not going to make a huge amount of money, but you're also not going to lose that investment. Um, the owners of PSE bought PSE for not a whole lot more than its physical, the worth of its physical assets. So even if it went completely under and got broken up and sold off, the investors would still get their principal back and they would be able to go off and invest it in something else. And remember, a dollar profit today is better than a profit tomorrow. A dollar profit tomorrow. Now, you may have heard about the Washington Clean Energy Transformation Act. This does what I-1631 basically wanted to do. But the only problem with that is we basically said, apart from coal, um, we're not going to start finding you until 2030, um, 10 years from now. And... 
you also, they don't even have to file a plan with the UTC to get off of fossil fuels for another two years. Um, the state is not going to let the power go out, even if PSE runs into financial trouble. You need only look down at California and PG&E. They've gone bankrupt twice in the last 20 years, and they will always be bailed out by a combination of state loan guarantees and uh, the state allowing them to hike rates. <clears throat> It's very hard to lose your money in the utility business. So, what we're trying to do here is kick PSE out. If we can't get PSE off of gas, we can get ourselves off of PSE. Um, we want to form a public utility district. Now, public utility districts are kind of a special Washington thing. Every municipality in the country has the ability to acquire uh, generation and transmission lines and provide electricity to their citizens. Um, Cleveland's a good example of that. But PUDs can be larger than that. PUDs can be the, you know, the size of a county. Some of them even span county lines. So Homer's PUDs uh, provide power to Camino Island, for instance. They can also be slightly smaller than county sizes, which is what we're proposing to do. Um, they, they're a lot like consumer-owned utilities. You wind up... You, they're run by three, three or five elected commissioners. We could expand the pool to five if we wanted to, but not at first. Um, and the commissioners are directly elected by the voters of the district. Now, if we want our PUD to do something, we have a much more direct line to its management than if we're trying to go through the UTC to get some PSE to do something. And as I said before, they're overwhelmingly cleaner than investor-owned utilities because PUDs tend to favor long-term generation investments that aren't reliable, uh, that don't rely on volatile sources of energy like fossil fuels. Now, if you want to make a large profit, speculating on fossil fuels can, can do that for you, but you're not going to be able to speculate on a, hyd on a hydro plant for the most part. And the other thing is public utility districts, or public utilities in general, are first in line for power generated by federal entities like the TVA in the South and BPA, which is our local federal power provider. They're, they're the ones who oper operate all the dams on the Columbia and Snake. So as you can see, we've got a lot of public utility districts in Washington State. This, the state law that allows people in any size region to form a PUD was written into law by the first ballot initiative in Washington State back in 1931. And so by now, we're kind of an outlier, and we're also kind of an embarrassment, because you, as you leave tonight, look at all the Teslas and Leafs you see driving around. They're powered by coal. I mean, come on, we can do better than that. And in terms of providing electrical power, a lot of the PUDs provide electrical power to their customers. So Amish PUD is one of the largest in the state. It's the second largest in the state. All right. It's the largest well, electric in the state. Say again? It's the largest electric in the state. Oh, yeah, largest electric. Third largest, largest water system. Yep. So these are the, the, these are the boundaries we're proposing. And you, we have maps on our website. We also have maps here. You can have a look at it. Um, it's essentially every municipality that touches I-90 plus Newcastle to the north, and everything from Kenmore and Mercer Island east, all the way to the county lines between Chelan, Kittivis, and Snohomish. There's about 550,000 people that live in this district, and the total number of electrical customers is 250 to 300,000, so that would put us behind Snohomish PUD in the number of customers. We wouldn't be the largest. We'd be the third largest public. Now, to do this, requires an annexation vote, and that requires turning in petitions to the tune of 10% of the number of people who, who voted in the last even number of year election, which is 27,000. Uh, the the uh, King County election says it's safer to turn in 35,000, but we want to turn in as many signatures as we get, as we can get, because talking to people allows us to get our message out, because PSE is going to have a much larger advertising budget than we are. They're going to blanket the airwaves. They're going, to, they're going to be able to push messages like, hey, we're cooking the planet, but on the other hand, here's a free light bulb. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. That's the kind of stuff they do. Um, now, this district is 
largely detached from the grid in the rest of the county. These areas down here, there's not anything on them. Those are the Issaquah Alps, they're mountains. Um, the only place where the grid is tightly coupled to anything PSE owns is in the Renton and Newcastle area, and there's not a whole lot of that either. That's a, that's a big ravine that goes right up to the uh, interstate there. So disconnecting from PSE is a relatively simple proposition. Acquiring all the assets might be more difficult, but from a technical perspective, it's not, that, not going to be that difficult. Not like, say, Boulder, which is shaped like a sea and is completely surrounded by their incumbent investor-owned utility. Now, the residents of this district voted in favor of I-1631 by about 53 to 47. Um, it won here, and in the southern part of the county that's not Seattle City Light Service area, not in this PUD, it, uh, that ballot initiative lost 60 to 40. So we're on much more favorable electoral terrain here, too. Um, and in a very high economic activity area like this, municipal bonds are going to be pretty cheap. Um, municipal bonds are tax deductible. They typically have lower rates than... Uh, other bonds, and that means that means the cost of capital to us if we were to borrow money to buy a, a revenue bond to buy all this wonderful electrical infrastructure from BSE, we won't be paying through the nose in terms of interest. Now, a lot of a lot of folks here are very concerned about the climate, and so am I. I mean, that's the whole reason I switched to electric an electric car out there. Um, but. You might ask, well, you know, if we're just going to switch power providers and they're going to sell that, that power elsewhere, you know, how does, that, how does that help? Well, the reason it's going to help is because right now PSE is in the process of decommissioning coal strip, that uh, big coal plant in Montana that uh, is, you know, a thousand miles away and generates a whole lot of electricity. By the way, the emissions from coal strip are actually worse than just what you see in the... Uh, the power mix because that's measured at the meter. They generate about 10 to 15 percent more power at coal strip, which means more emissions, and they lose that 10 to 15 percent transmitting it all that vast distance. Um, so, where what would happen if we were to say knock 25 percent off of this demand? Where would it come from? It's not going to come from the wholesale market up here because they buy that when it's cheaper, when it's cheaper to buy wholesale than anything else. Um, hydro contracts, eventually those will free up in 2028, 2031, but for now, they're stuck. Uh, they have to take that power or they have to pay a penalty. Um, the Centralia coal might come from that. It's not going to come from wind. It's not going to come from uh, PSE-owned hydro, but it's probably going to come from PSE-owned gas and PSE owned coal. So when PSE shuts off coal strip, if we're not there, they're not going to be turning on a whole lot of gas plants. And that's the important thing. And, and the Centralia plants are closing down the two plants. One's closing down at the end of this year, and then the other one's closing down five years. And that was done by Christine Gregoire long yep. ago. Yep. So coal is going away, and if we don't want gas to replace it, we need to replace PSE. So if we go out and we build renewable generation and storage for it, um, or you know, we just say, hey, we want to buy this and you know, other people generate it, that's fine too. But we're going to be cutting from, we're going to be taking bites out of the state's largest carbon emitting, largest carbon, carbon emitter. And we might be able to knock half of their emissions off. That would be very nice. Um, Generally speaking, PUDs have a lighter regulatory burden. They don't, they're not regulated by the UTC because you can pretty much count on people that you can throw out of office not to gouge you. I hope. <laughs> but the point is, that, that has happened before. There have been large numbers of PUD directors that were thrown out over a very, very uh, badly managed project back in the late 70s and early 80s. Biz, yes, whoops. Um, Bills might not be lower at first, but if we're not paying, we're, if we're not shoveling profits in the pockets of the funds that own PSE, we can use that money, not change our bills, but we can use that money to do something that's not going to cook the planet with it. 
And so to get there, we're going to need to talk to our neighbors, gather signatures. We're going to have to find people to run for these uh, these commissioner positions. We want good people to run for it. I mean, I don't want to... I, I, the, the, the term PUD commissioner good space guy fills me with terror. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not going to happen. I hope. Um, and we also need to gather endorsements from group, other groups, and we need to raise money to pay for things like feasibility studies and engineering studies that will, that we need to take to the voters to say, hey, this is how this is going to work. This is roughly how it's going to co- how much it's going to cost, and then we need to actually win the election. And that's the easy part. <laughs> Then we have to support the newly formed PUD as it acquires PSE's generation capacity and switches our power mix from something very dirty to something very clean. All right. Did I go a little bit too fast there? No, you're good. All right. If you could add to that that end there, that you have a 10-year window to acquire the system. Yes. Yeah, when a, when a PUD forms, it has 10 years to acquire the generating and transmitting assets in the district. I don't think it has to do the entire district, but it has to acquire a certain amount of it. Right, and you also can choose utilities, like you could do water, you could do sewer. Uh, new formations can't do fiber, unfortunately. Don't yeah. ask me, they have good lobbyists. No, Comcast has good lobbyists. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. So if I understand you, at least initially, we wouldn't be... PUD wouldn't be replacing PSE, we'd be operating alongside it, but we'd be taking customers away from them. Not really. What are you operating? Repeat the question. Okay, so the question was, would this be a new utility that operates side by side with PSE? Um, It would not be. Fortunately, this is not a theoretical question. Jefferson PUD acquired PSE's assets in Jefferson County back in 2008, and they're a fairly small um, cut small um, area. They only have about 35,000 customers, as I recall. But it took them about five years to negotiate a price and then purchase it and do the cutover between PSE and the PUD. And after that, they were running their grid. So it's, there's not a parallel portion there, but you have to build out the infrastructure necessary to do that switch over. And it would be the PUD commissioners that would be directing that effort. They would be hiring people to run the PUD. Fortunately, we have a lot of people who work in the energy, technology, and electrical sectors around here. Yes? So the PUD would own all the assets within that area, including transmission lines and everything? The question was, the question, the question was, would the uh, public utility own all the transmission and distribution lines? Now, if there's like a transmission line that just kind of cuts over the territory but doesn't serve us, we wouldn't be acquiring that. But anything that serves cus- that serves customers here, from transmission lines to um, distribution lines, we would be acquiring. We could also acquire the Snoqualmie generating facility if we so chose. Um, we would probably not be acquiring Tanner or Electric Cooperative. Um, they're a small cooperative around North Bend. But other than that, we would basically just be dropping in and replacing PSE in this area. Yeah. Yes? Uh, can you go back a slide or two on my question in reference to the, uh, uh, the I'm sorry, go forward to, I think, right there. Yeah. So in, in terms of how we get there, um, does the organization you know, have a plan or a roadmap in place in terms of how to, you know, tackle that project? Well, we know, we know what we have to do, but generally speaking, we're focused on the task ahead of us right now. We, have, we are making plans to do the general campaign, but right now we're focusing on, focusing on signature gathering. We need to get that done. Okay, so that needs to happen before anything else? That's correct. We also need to raise money for the general election campaign. Yes? So I guess I still don't quite understand. What if PSE just doesn't want to sell those assets? Condemnation. Um, I mean, so the question is, what if PSE doesn't want to sell? PUD law allows them to do condemnation. It's a situation where the judge or a jury, depending on which choice is made, uh, makes the decision. And generally, it's very difficult to assess electric utilities because they minimize their 
value when they're getting taxed. They maximize their value when they're getting bought. So the judge has to look at both extremes. And generally, the publics are honest about saying what the system's worth. They quadruple, especially in the campaign, or five times the value of the system and tell huge lies about what their value is because they have nothing to lose by a higher price. Well, they do have one thing to lose. For instance, if they're making false statements about things they've reported to the SEC, that might land them in trouble. We have a, because we're such a large area of PSE, it would be very difficult for them to do the quadruple valuation that they've tried to do elsewhere because we're a quarter of their customers and they say, you know, this is worth $4 billion. And they say, you know, $4 billion of, transmit, of distribution assets. Well, you know, now would be the time to form public utilities elsewhere because the rest of that stuff's worth zero. I would hope that would work. <laughs> All right, we're, we're going to move on here. We'll have more time for questions afterwards. It's, okay. Okay. <laughs> Our next guest is Congressman Dennis Kucinich. And we are very, very pleased to have him. And I'm honored that he has offered his time to be with us tonight. Dennis served 16 years in Congress. But before that, when he was very young, he was mayor of Cleveland. One of his campaign promises was to preserve the city muni, the Cleveland muni, as a public service. However, the bank wanted the muni. Dennis was elected, and he revoked the sale. And it was, uh, it was a difficult time for Dennis because there were lots of threats, and he actually lost the next election um, and was later honored for his part in saving the Muni. Anyway, Dennis has been working on a book. It's about 600 pages about his experience uh, in the successful campaign to save the Muni. Well, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Dennis Kucinich. very much. As, as Linda may have told some of you, my voice is, uh, this might be the first time in my life I've ever had laryngitis. But um, I have only a couple options. I can talk like the Godfather. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for honoring my family this evening. <laughs> or I can talk like a duck. <laughs> or I can just try to struggle through here. So, um, Thank you for being here, and Joe, I have to say that your presentation was excellent. Really, that takes a lot of work to do. And Linda, thank you for making it possible for me to be here, and the timing of this worked out, and I want to thank each and every one of you for your, um, for your interest in, in creating, in really expressing the true meaning of public power. This is probably the biggest question of our time with respect to our relations with governments and corporations. <clears throat> who, who has the power? And if you remember Lincoln's prayer in his Gettysburg Address, he, he said that a, that a government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish. But we have to keep in mind that what he was speaking of was something very deep in the American experience, and that is that each of us has a say in how our government works and how the institutions of our society should work, and they should work on our behalf. Corporate charters, the history of corporate charters, has been that uh, they form ostensibly for some public purpose that changed years ago. But uh, the truth of the matter is that corporations have gone far away from uh, any, any pretense of, of public service and public interest. They serve themselves. Uh, they do it at great cost to the people. And the reason why we have uh, 
atmosphere carbon levels at over 416 parts per million is that um, there has been very little effort on the part of corporations to change their energy strategies, to uh, change their energy mix. As Joe pointed out, uh, they will squeeze every last, last drop of fossil fuel out of the earth if they can, even as we're warned that sea levels are rising, even as we're warned that the world that we hope our children and grandchildren will inherit will be safer, it will make it dramatically more, diff um, more difficult than it is today. And so here in East King County, each one of you, wherever the journey is that you came from in your life, arrives as a community at this moment where you have an opportunity to be able to take a stand on behalf of the life of your community, on behalf of, of the life of your family, to be able to actually, in the truest sense, reclaim power um, consistent with Lincoln's prayer of a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. This is really our right. Utilities don't have an inherent right to operate. They get franchises. And they have to go through a process to get, get, get that. And they usually get franchises for 99 years. But they don't have an inherent right to do that. You, the people of East King County, have an inherent right to operate your own public utility. And that you come together this evening to talk about the steps that must be taken to make that happen, I think is a is a sacred moment of awareness, of commitment, of a realization of the potential which you have to be able to transform the future of this area. The, um, <clears throat> the fight that we had in Cleveland was extraordinary. I mean, I was actually elected mayor on a promise to save Muni Light after the city council and the mayor previous to me had already sold it, it was sold. And so I intervened with a petition drive to stop the sale. Uh, that's when the first assassination attempt was made. A uh, high-powered rifle shot missed my head by inches. That was just a freak that I got up almost a split second before the shot was made through, through, the, through my house. Um, and what was at stake, the uh, private utility had built two nuclear power plants and they needed to expand their revenue in order to pay off the very high debt that they had encumbered uh, in the building of these nuclear power plants, which had not been operating. Uh, so <clears throat> they needed the addition of Muni Light to pump up their, um, their base and to bring in more revenue. And, the, um, and while I was elected on a promise to save Muni Light, my first act in office was to cancel the sale. On December 15, 1978, the biggest bank in Ohio told me, look, we're not going to renew the loans that the city has coming due. On, on, I hadn't even borrowed, borrowed my previous administration. Unless you sell Muni Light, we offered them property tax revenue, income tax revenue, sale of city property. They, didn't, they wouldn't go with any of it. The only thing that they would take was Muni Light. We found out afterwards that the banks had interlocking directorates with, you, with that um, private utility. And in a way, they were the same company. The banks had, um, uh, were the largest shareholder, and the... Uh, uh, the utility had their pension funds in that bank. They were, the utility had uh, 25 million, which was a lot of money then, and demand deposits. And the, this, they were intertwined in so many ways. Um, the extraordinary story about Muni Light is, is not just about me. It's about after after what you saw. When you saw where I was talking to an anchor, that was 
on the day uh, 6 o'clock on the very day of default, December 15th, 1978. And uh, I walked into the studio. I had no idea what was going to be said. This is where they publicly announced that there were $50 million that they would loan the city if I would agree to sell. Um, of course, I, you saw me turn it down, uh, but think about this. This story of their offer was communicated in every newspaper, in every, in every, every radio station, every television station. Everyone understood that it, on that day that I had a choice to make, and then people were thinking, well, you turned down $50 million for this light system. Um, the next day, I filed a complaint with the U.S. Justice Department asking them to, inter to uh, investigate this extortionate conduct on the part of the uh, banks. And they denied that they ever wanted Muni Light. They denied that they ever made an offer. <laughs> they denied the whole thing. They gaslit an entire metropolitan area. And they pulled it off. It, it was as if it never happened. So, the importance of this story today is that when you challenge uh, this kind of corporate power, uh, you have to be ready to stand fast. You have to, you're not only taking them on, you're taking their friends on. You need to know who their friends are. You need to understand that you have power to fight back. Uh, but you also have to know that, you know, with a company, um, I think, PSC's uh, 10K that they filed with the SEC in 2018, stated that they had over $3 billion in annual revenue. Um, <clears throat> and I would urge, you know, those of you who are really involved in this campaign, get the documents that are on file. You'll learn a lot about the company. They have over a million residential customers. Uh, as you pointed out, Joe, you end up taking about a quarter of them away. Uh, and that's the biggest share of their customers. They, of course, have uh, a good number, thousands and thousands of uh, commercial customers, a smaller number, over a thousand industrial customers, and a few thousand classified in the report as others. Um, they're, you're, you're looking at taking a big chunk of their revenue, and uh, they will fight to just keep it. What I think is interesting is the possibility that uh, in Thurston County, there may be a ballot issue. I think there will be a ballot issue in November. And so then when you have two counties who are fighting this battle, it's going to be a lot more difficult for this company. They have to spend a lot more money. And it will be, um, uh, and it'll be possible for you to offset the kind of power they have because they're not concentrating only on in the East King County area. You have to be organized. You'll have to go door to door if you're talking about a potential 250,000 customers, uh, of which, uh, let's say, 200,000. Or a little more than 200,000 might be residential. Uh, you really need to set up a door to door campaign. What are the issues? What they were in Olympia, and I'm sure their issues are similar reliability, the uh, number of outages. And why do outages occur? Because companies don't want to spend money to buy equipment, or they don't want to pay uh, higher enough employees to service the lines. There's only a few reasons why you have outages. Sure, you can have weather, you can have ice storms. But if you have an ice storm, you can get your linemen out there right away and start working on repair, start working on restoration. And while we all understand <clears throat> extraordinary weather events, we, we also know that if they had, don't have any competition, what's, what no skin off their nose if you have to wait a couple of days? The businesses, commercial customers can be your friends because if any of them have been inconvenienced, 
by outages, even for a couple of days, you know, if you have a restaurant and your food can start to spoil after 24 hours. Uh, people who rely on electricity, if they're out for more than a 8 to 12 hours, it can have a real impact. They have to send people home. It starts to cost, not just the cost of the electricity, it has other extenuating uh, economic impacts on businesses. And so as you go around and talk to people, you, you need to ask questions as much as you should be telling people what you're going to do. Um, I'm glad you said, Joe, that it doesn't necessarily mean lower rates right away. Because you don't want to promise something you cannot deliver right away. But what it will mean is the money comes back to this community. It's not going to uh, Canada or the Netherlands or where, wherever they're located or may relocate. That's a big selling point. It will help with the economic development. Actually, public power, when it was established, Cleveland was one of the first ones in um, 1911 when Muni Light was established. The reason was for economic development to help businesses, to help ensure the growth of businesses. And I, I, I think that when you, um, when you enlist the help of businesses, it becomes really important. What does it mean for them? It means that they'll be able to have control over rates in a way that they can today. And it's really a big thing for everyone. You know, you can, if, you know, depending on what report you read, the rate of return of PSA, uh, in some reports it says it's close to 10%. In other reports, they might say it's as low as 6.5. But each year, they're making a, a rate of return you think about any of us putting putting money into any investment and getting anywhere from six to ten percent? Are you kidding? Yeah. I mean, utilities are cash cows. The only difference is you're the ones who are getting milked. <laughs> and, and so, and and you know, it's impossible to operate a utility and lose money. Impossible. I mean, you you have to be you have to be crooked beyond belief to lose money. And so. This is really an important moment in this community, and, and, and it's a great time to stand up because all, all, all across America, people are looking for ways to stand up and, and resist the, uh, the, this tide of control, this effort to try to tell us as people we can't do anything about anything. We're just you know, pawns in some kind of great uh, geopolitical game. It's not true. Public power is really the vehicle to declare who we are, to declare that uh, we are, are, are ready to uh, defend our own interests. And, you know, as someone who uh, literally put my life on the line to fight for public power in Cleveland, um, and the people of Cleveland did, 15 years later, uh, when they determined uh, that the system was going to expand and they knew that expansion could never have occurred unless I made this decision, that's when they wanted me to come back. <laughs> and, and yeah, really. It took 15 years to make a comeback, but fortunately, I had plenty of time to spare. <laughs> but, but the thing to keep in mind, and this is something that you can start calculating, look at whatever the cost of street lights are in these various communities. You really should make a grid of what local communities are paying for street lights. Because my guess is that PSC is making a premium <clears throat> from some of these local communities. And, it, and, it's, and the cost of streetlights is charged directly to the city. So it comes right out of the city budget. So you can actually, you know, if you can do the, the, uh, the research, you may be able to say they keep taxes lower. And that's a fact. I mean, we, you, you, in Cleveland, we had um, uh, the streetlights that were provided by um, Muni Light, and also uh, 76 city facilities. So you have not just the street lights, but the power that's provided to various city buildings and, and operations. Uh, you factor that in, and that starts to amount to a significant amount of money in community after community. Uh, you know, people, don't, people should never be forced to paying higher taxes in order for utility bills. Uh, 
in order uh, in order to increase utility rates. But that's one of the factors involved in taxes at a municipal level. Uh, the people discovered in Cleveland, this was in 93, so I haven't really bothered to calculate what the numbers would be now. But the savings to the ratepayers and taxpayers combined, just for a city where we had about 50,000 customers, not, not a quarter of a million, but 50,000, just in a period of 15 years, the savings as a result of saving Muni Light went into hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, you can understand there's a lot of money at stake here, and that's why some people will fight with everything they have. You're going to be asked by people, you know, you have certain unions who are working directly with PAC and others who are working indirectly through contracts. The thing that I would, uh, you know, exhort you to, to do is to, is to make sure that, that, that uh, people know that you intend to make sure that the community is going to hire union people. And it makes sense because you want people to understand how to operate their job. You want union linemen, you want people who understand the transmission and distribution system. And, um, and it's a lot cheaper, actually. And I think you need to head off that, that right away, that you're going to make sure that there's union. And there'll be jobs available for the people who are working right now for PSC. That there'll be a place for them, that you want them to apply. And, and what will they get? They'll get stability. You know, their pensions aren't protected working for private corporations. There, there, there's contracts that are up in 2021, some uh, organized labor contracts with PSC. There's one that just, uh, they're probably in negotiations right now for a renewal of another major contract. You need to make the point that the workers are going to be protected. And not only that, but as you move into alternative energy, uh, you'll be able to hire more people. And, and of course, the environmental issue, which Joe covered so well. You know, we're in a time where we understand we have a moral obligation on this. It's not even a close question. When I was uh, just starting in Congress in 1997, uh, I was on the... Um, Government Oversight Committee, the Investigative Committee of Congress. And so this would have been um, you know, 20 some years ago. Um, one of my first meetings, I was uh, uh, provided an opportunity to look at a secret report, okay? And a secret report 20 some years ago talked about sea levels rising as a result of the trajectory of environmental impact of the use of uh, fossil fuels. People knew this years ago. They knew it was going to happen. But just like government officials just ignored it until we started to see the effects of rising sea levels, of changes in migration patterns, of species disappearing. But we knew it back then. This isn't new. Forty years ago, René Dubois wrote a book that talked about how we cannot keep having these impacts and expect on the environment, expect that it's not going to create some change, uh, which is irrevocable. So we're here at this moment in time where we have an opportunity to take a new direction and, and know that when you have come together for this, that this is really a sacred cause. And, and it can't be any greater thing for people to do than to come together in defense of their own economic rights and, and the rights of the community. So I, I'm here to, uh, you know, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Um, I'm here to uh, support your efforts in any way that I can. And I'm also here to tell you that no matter the battle, you can win this. You can win. Doesn't matter what anybody says, you can win. And when you win, East King County will be established as a place where um, Freedom, in, in, a, in a truest sense, is really alive and well. That public power uh, has planted its flag very firmly in the soil of this community. And then uh, and everyone, when they talk about this community, <coughs> will speak with the deepest respect about what people are able to do when they come together. 
one does not know where this could lead you, but I can tell you just this moment in this kind of a meeting has the potential to change more than you could ever imagine. So I salute you, encourage you, and I'm proud to be here with you. Thank you very much. to uh, BB's uh, honey and lemon water. Uh, this voice was brought to you by BB's <laughs> restaurant. <laughs> okay, so I, I can answer some questions, and I'd be glad to. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, uh, I assume that you all know, but it hasn't been mentioned today, that Dennis Kucinich was a candidate for President of the United States. Yes. And an excellent one at that, so it needs to be recognized for that also. But, uh, but my question is, um, we have an LNG plant in, in uh, a huge one that hasn't started yet, that was built without a permit. By definition, that's illegal. And you don't know how that happened, you're not familiar with our area. but. Why can't it be stopped? It sounds like corruption to me, you know. Uh, what, what kind of agency do we go to for recompense on this? Well, you, you know, all over the country, uh, you know, Ohio and Pennsylvania become pin cushions for the fracking industry. Uh, when, I, when I ran for governor of Ohio a few years ago, I, I said one of the first things I would do would be, be, be to ban fracking and deep injection wells. Uh, they, there was a sacrifice on in Ohio on this. But what's happened is that the oil and gas industry, um, using the power of the federal government, has been able to run pipelines across the country and work with Canada uh, to bring pipelines across. Uh, you know, I, I was you know I was out to North Dakota to support Native peoples. <coughs> My wife and I were out there a couple of years ago. We were out there with one of your local citizens by the name of Dave Matthews. And, yeah, I mean, we, we were out there in a, in, in a blizzard to, to make sure Standing Rock people knew they had support. But this whole thing about exploiting energy sources is going on everywhere. The U.S. has become a net exporter as a result. And, uh, and, and our, our politics are being driven by energy choices. I mean, it's the reason why we attacked Iraq. It's the reason why we attacked Libya. It's the reason why we threaten Iran and other countries around the world. Because what we're trying to do uh, is the, power, the energy companies are using the power of government to be able to uh, just cash in. So what can you do with respect to the LNG plant? Um, I. I I don't know if you, you know, if you have attorneys that you have contacted, but it, it would seem to me if they don't have a permit, that, by the way, not having a permit doesn't necessarily stop them. Uh, I, you know, I mean, this was in New York State. Uh, I, I joined a number of citizens in Hudson Valley. See, I'm not new at this stuff. I joined, this was recently. I was in Hudson Valley with people who were protesting the um, infra uh, frac gas infrastructure and compressor stations that were being set up in some of the most pristine agricultural land anywhere. And these people corrupted the system of New York State government, and they were able to go through, and the permits were like they were, they were just skating through the permitting process. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's really critical, <clears throat> and these, these permits are both state and federal permits. It's really critical that you get somebody who's familiar with the law who will raise the question. Because it seems to me if you have a basis to do so, you probably could go into federal court and, and, uh, and get an injunction against the, the building. It doesn't mean that the permitting process will stop. They may be in the middle of a permitting process right now. And so you need to find out what that process is at what jurisdiction and you may find out there are certain officials that you didn't know that already gave them a green light and, and start to create some political, you know, we're in an election here and you, this is when you, the people, have 
some pressure you can put on public officials. I just received yesterday a documentary that I don't think has been released about the LNG plant. I'm eager to see it. Um, and what I can tell you is, I'll, uh, Linda, I'll be in touch with you and see what I can find. But for you, though, get an attorney who's really, you know, will do the work initially. And then, um, you know, the, you, you, may, you may find that you have a basis to slow it down. And let me just tell you something. Tell you something about slowing a project down. 2000 and 2000, I think it was, um, the um, CSX Railroad came to a local mayor in the Cleveland, in a suburb, Cleveland suburb, and they told him that um, this quiet s suburban community was going to have, go from eight trains a day to 48 trains a day. Freight trains. Okay. So the mayor, who happened to be a Republican mayor, came to my office immediately, and he said, they're going to kill our community and others along the route. So um, I immediately had my attorney uh, call the Surface Transportation Board and find out when the deadline was for filing an objection. Well, guess what? The railroad made the mistake of coming in and telling the mayor about this on the very day for the last moment to file an objection. We had a window of about 45 minutes. <laughs> My attorney filed at the surface transportation board, like right in under the door, literally. So we were in a position to object legally. So you have to find out what this process is. I'll tell you the rest of the story. The head of C the, the, the head of, of the railroad came to my office when after I objected to see um, and, and what he told me, and this person later on became a member of a presidential cabinet, a very well known name. What he told me was um, look. You can't stop this merger because, you know, what I was doing, I was objecting to a merger bet between uh, Conrail and, and two other railroads. And he told me, he said, you can't, you can't stop this merger. And I told him, you know, you're right. I don't want to stop it. This is a multi-billion dollar merger. I don't want to stop it. I just want to slow it down. Because what happens if you slow down this kind of a deal. The money that you create an effect on the finances of the company. And, and, and I mean, when he understood that what I was looking at here, all of a sudden they came to an agreement which limited rail traffic and, uh, and, and, and the certain times of the day and so many trains a day. And when we filed this case at the Surface Transportation Board and finalized that we were the only Community, community in America who had such a deal. So I'm, I'm telling you this story because it's worth your time to do some research on this, to find out, you know, uh, you know it, what's the permit process, when's the deadline to file, state, federal, and you may, you may be able to get one of the local communities to file an objection and tie it up. And that's when you're in a bargaining position. So, just sharing with you some experience. Yes, ma'am. Um, I was just reading an article in the Sierra uh, Club magazine about community, uh, community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, which is operating out of um, nationally. And I wanted to know if you know about it. They just stopped a community, a small community, which is opposing fracking in their community. Mm -hmm. They managed to put an end to that. So, I wonder, is that something you're familiar with? Yeah, well, you see there's environmental factors, there's race factors. Uh, you know, if, uh, if a Native peoples are involved, there's certain human rights issues. And, and so that's why you have to look at everything that could be involved. But yes, of course, I mean, there are, you know, public citizen is a group that you should contact in Washington, D.C. They may, they, they may be able to help. Um, uh, 
but I always believe that if you get an attorney who works with the group, they can go in and take a look at it and tell you what the, you know, if they have some environmental experience, they can tell you what to do. Because a lot of these groups who are working on projects like that one, they're overburdened. And, and so you've got to find someone who will take this case. Next question. Yes, ma'am. Um, uh, I'm not involved in working on another project that which is fighting PSE unnecessary investments. PSE has done um, uh, a lot to bring basically all the businesses in the community uh, behind them. So they have paraded in business after business to testify at hearings about why they support the project, et cetera, et cetera. Um, our outreach to businesses has been basically um, totally unsuccessful, even to places like Microsoft, who are leaving PSE and generating their, getting their own power directly away from PSE. So we've been completely unsuccessful at getting any business behind us. Do you have any advice on how to do that? Well, um, you know, one of the things you need to do is to get somebody who's familiar with utility rates. Because what sometimes happens <clears throat> is that you'll discover that residential customers are actually subsidizing commercial customers. You have to have an analysis of, of the rates. You need somebody who's familiar with the rate structure. And that could be one reason why, you know, they're getting a certain, uh, what's called a delta rate. And, and that would be, hey, you're going to lose this, you know. There's nothing that stops. Uh, a PUD from trying to help people get a decent rate to help businesses. You can do that. So you may have to get into that argument. Look, we, we can give you a decent rate as well. We're not opposed to you. The same thing is true. We had this discussion in Olympia yesterday. Um, what happens to people who are on the other end, you know, who are kind of falling off the edge economically? Is there any help for them? Yeah, you can establish a special rate for people who are, are you know, in poverty. But I mean, I think PSE does the fear mongering thing, like you know, your course. liability is going to be worse. You know, you're just not going to have this big safety net. Blah blah blah. So I think I think uh, the big companies seem naive and just well, follow their friends. All you need is rotary. Carry a map with you if you're going. You can point to twenty. Seven districts, public utility districts in the state, uh, and and no one's you know losing anything, and the, the economic prosperity of the region continues to move. People want to come out here, and and one of the reasons is I would think that Washington State has probably more people who are under public utility districts than any other state in the country. And so you, you really have something very special here. And so, um, but you, you need to make that point. What, okay, I'm just told there's one more question. Yes, sir. So you said back in the 70s you were elected based on a promise to keep Muni. Right. What, was, what was the public interest behind that? Why, were, why was the public so interested? The in rates were 20% cheaper. Okay. Uh, and to 25 percent cheaper, and they provided they saved the taxpayers money because it was cheaper street lighting, and cheaper uh, cost to electricity. Thank you for asking that. The uh, and and people were really able to save money. Now in Cleveland, think about this: the utilities competed house to house. Uh, Muni Light had had about a third of the, the city where it was, it was concentrated. And the fact that um, we were able to save it was miraculous because we finally went to the ballot when people didn't understand about the default. That's one of the reasons why I wasn't reelected. And uh, But I did ask the people to support keeping Muni Light in a ballot issue. And we were losing, um, according to polls, we were getting defeated two to one. But because we drove home the issue of people saving, of having accountability and reliability and things like that, um, we had this miracle occur where we actually won the issue by two to one. 
and, and those were polls, you know, in, a, in an election, as opposed to a poll that had been taken six six weeks earlier. The story, by the way, of Muni Light is, is one, you know, again, I'm, I've been working on this uh, for decades and finally finished it. And after seeing a trailer that we're using to promote uh, the book and, and maybe some other things with it, but uh, it happened. And, and it, it, it's, it's a cautionary tale about what's at stake here. Before I, I, I conclude, I just want to recognize the presence of, uh, of a really great public servant, someone who I'm proud to call a friend. I see uh, Senator Marilyn Chase here. I asked Marilyn um, if she might like to tell us something about um, PSE or taxes, because this is something that, um, and did you say yes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, most people don't know that the public gives money to corporations to do business here. Marilyn knows. So <laughs> let me pass you to Senator oh, Marilyn Chase from the 30 second. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis, once again for your enlightening information. We appreciate that. Um, you know, we tried to stop Macri from buying PSE. And some of you may remember um, what they did. I think it was in 2008. Um, Bob Hasegawa and I were in the, in the, uh, the house at the time. And uh, so they hired, uh, well, we got them uh, I liked your, your comments, Dennis, about slowing the project down, make it cost a little bit more for them. We stopped some of their bond sales in the London bond market. And, uh, I mean, you, you just simply have to go after all those folks. Oh, thank you. I have a new hip and new knee. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's good. It's good. Um, but they hired a... Uh, Macri hired uh, one of the foremost political consulting firms in this state, uh, and they paid him an incredible amount of money. They had, they, you know, when you talk about going door to door, they went door to door several times. They had yard signs all up. We had, I'm trying to think, I think we had five or six um, counties. I don't remember. How many did we have going then in 2012? 2008. Hmm? Three counties. Three counties, yeah. Uh, okay. Jefferson Island, which didn't have a PUD. That's right. And Skagit, Thurston. which was a very large water. But didn't we system. also try in, in uh, Thurston? Thurston in 2012. 12, yeah, right. Um, so they, they know that we're coming for them. Um, you know, so <laughs> we need to be smart about this. We cannot go out and just because we don't like public power and we don't like them making a profit off of us, we're not going to win on that. We have to do the research. We simply have to. Uh, there are good lawyers that you mentioned. There are good lawyers who will help. Um, and we can also get a lot of the research done, um, you know, without it costing us a t ton of money. We know how to do that. Um, Macri is a... And they're an, uh, an investment company from Australia. Right. And when they came in, they said, we are going to, we are, we have long, slow and patient capital. So we're not going to turn over here. This is going to be a long-term investment. Well, they're gone now. <laughs> you know, and uh, that's just after just a, a few years. Um, so we simply cannot take what any of them tell us and think that, oh, you know, they're, they're nice, principled people. They're not. They're not. <laughs> Public utilities are a profit center for these guys. Uh, and unfortunately, public utilities, you know, like water and sewer, have become a profit center for municipalities. And back in 1992, um, I think it was, when we were passing the Growth Management Act, to, in order to get the, utility, the uh, municipalities on board with the Growth Management Act, the legislature cut them a deal to say that they could, if they owned, say, water and sewer, that they, there could be no limit on the amount of money, uh, tax rates that, 
they could charge to, to support their, their operations. Uh, so in, in this state, if you want to look and see, sometimes there are 30% tax rates. You know, uh, it, it is really very difficult for poor municipalities to try to survive if they don't have a tax base. So the utilities have become the tax base. And we need to be aware of that. I mean, they get, they, they're really mad at me because I go after them. Um, they don't want people to know. We've even got a, I'd be happy to share it with you. We've got a little video that uh, showing how the utilities have become the cash cows. You know, um, and, and it truly is that way in this state. So, um, and, and the other thing that we need to be aware of, do not think just because we have a PUD that it will be a principled operation. Snowpud was captured. Um, and they were using it to launder money. Some of the some of the folks out in the state were using it to launder money, so they could get access to your state tax dollars. Our our state constitution is very clear that our tax dollars are not to be spent to private entities. So and, and you know, it's like five different sections of the constitution have that in it, and and the state cannot own stock. So what the Department of Commerce did, the director of the Park Department of Commerce, Rogers Weed, and his, his assistant director and one of the lawyers down there, they set up a deal where they would give Snowpud money to do projects. Snowpud would then subcontract the work to that same company. <laughs> it's corruption, you wouldn't believe, just terrible corruption. We need to be aware that that can happen. A PUD can be captured, you know, and, and that's why it is very important that we participate in these PUD elections. And I talked to um, Rebecca Wolf, uh, who sends her regards to you. She was your state campaign coordinator a few years back, and she's down at a, she's now a public u uh, utility commissioner for a snowpad. We've got, we've got one person in there, now we're trying to get two more in there, and you know, it, People need to prepare themselves to run for commissioner. You know, you got, you know we, we can set these things up, but if we don't have people prepared, and I mean really prepared, informed, not just because they're operating by, by outrage at some violation of their personal code, you know, we need to start now. It is as important for us to start now to prepare people to run for commissioner as it is for us to establish you know, the, 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 the PUDs itself. <clears throat> so anyway, that's my story. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, Marilyn taught me how to look at exemptions uh, in the state records. And one thing we discovered is that in certain areas, there are more exemptions than funds coming in. And that's how it works. Um, I have one more thing. It'll take about 90 seconds. Marilyn is going to talk about taking signatures. And I thank you, Marilyn, very much. I wish we could just go on all night. But I think, yeah, I think the restaurant needs to go home pretty soon. So now, Marilyn Myers. So the first thing, as Joe has already pointed out, is that we need signatures. And I know a number of you have agreed to become the signature gatherers, but I have petitions here, 20 slots each for names. I'm asking if each of you could commit to getting at least one that you could find friends and colleagues and neighbors to fill in 20 spaces for that. So I'm going to pass it around. If you take one, please, if you haven't already. And the other thing is, I just also want to give in a plug for 350 East Side, which is meeting on the third Wednesdays of every month uh, at East Shore Unitarian Church in Bellevue. So I encourage you to come and learn and um, engage with people there. I'll just mention one last thing. April 5th, uh, there is a um, something called FIRE. It's called, called Fostering Interfaith Relations on the East Side. Is having a dinner looking at our responsibility to the earth, to life on earth. It's about climate change, that kind of thing. If you're a member of any kind of faith community, if you could come to that, it's a potluck common. Um, there will be speakers from six different faith communities, 
And the idea is to, um, at tables of eight each, to sit around and talk about what you're doing, what you need to do, what kind of moral commitment you made. As um, Dennis Kucinich mentioned, this is a moral cause, and a, um, any kind of inter-faith uh, kind of effort, it just go towards that. So I just want to mention that. It would be great to see you all there. So here are the petitions, if you'd please grab one. And um, I've also got um, a kind of um, sheet for signature gathers about sort of the do's to help you do that. So I'll pass that around as well. So, yeah. What will people need to know? Um, I just, um, while Marilyn is passing this out, I want to just recognize that we have another public official here, and that is Chris Stearns, who is commissioner, PUD commissioner in Thurston County. Thank you so much. I just wanted to make one correction. When you run for PUD commissioner, you get nominated in the primary in your district. So you're not running countywide in the primary election. If there are only two candidates, you automatically go to the general. The general is district-wide, the whole district. So that means three times the electorate if you have three commissioners. The few PUDs that have five have to be major generating PUDs like Grant and uh, Chelan. And those two extra commissioners are elected to four-year terms countywide. So they're a little different. They're the only two PUDs or counties that have enough generation to apply to the law that they created, obviously for themselves. Numbers can also do it, too. You have to have over a million, or half a million. That's right. I think we might qualify for that. Okay. Um, everybody, I'm very honored that you came tonight. I'm honored to have Marilyn and Dennis and all the people who have been organizing, and all of you. So thank you very much. Thank you.